All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the sixth and final installment in our webinar series, the Indian Energy Minerals Forum. Uh, this one is focused on access to capital for tribal energy projects. So this is co-hosted with Sagebrush Hill Group, LLC. We have Derek Watchman and Steve Gray moderating along with our own Mike Moore. Uh, this webinar series has been such an insightful journey into the ever-growing world of tribal energy, and we're very grateful to have a hand in the process of spreading the word to everyone involved in tribal energy and possibly open the eyes of others to new opportunities from a tribal perspective. Today, we also have USDA's Acting Executive Director, Mrs. Sheila Hollis here, who will join us for just a few minutes, uh, but we're happy that she can join us and say a few words on behalf of USDA. Uh, so first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Littlefield. I'm a program coordinator with the USEA Consensus Program. Just a note on us, we're formally named Building Consensus, Consensus on Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage. We call this Consensus for short. Uh, this is a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Uh, our program seeks to educate the public, policymakers, industry, stakeholders on CCUS and carbon management technologies uh, by webbing, webinars, um, a series of monthly educational briefings, uh, conference workshops, we release technical reports, as well as a monthly news clips of CCUS and carbon management related updates. If you'd like to join our mailing list, if you have not done, done so already, feel free to send an email address to, email to the address at the bottom of your screen, and we'll add, add you as a subscriber. So at the end of the session, after our three speakers, we will have a question and answer portion. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit a question, and we'll address as many as we can. This webinar will also be recorded and posted on our event page, along with the presentation slides, but we do appreciate you taking the time to join us live. Uh, the previous five webinars are also posted on the website if you would like to catch up with everything uh, that we've done so far in this webinar series. So thank you all very much. And with that, I will pass it along to Mrs. Sheila Hollis. Thanks so much, Michelle. And uh, it's a great honor to be here and to join you uh, on issues uh, which I actually care personally and uh, professionally about a great deal being, a, being a, uh, a native of the Four Corners area. Uh, I'm Sheila Hollis. I'm the Acting Executive Director of USEA. And uh, I'm here to greet you and to tell you just for a, a moment or two about what USEA does and, and uh, our vision uh, and our mandate in hand in hand with the State Department, the Department of Energy and USAID in particular. Uh, our organization, um, nonprofit, non-lobbying, nonpartisan, uh, <clears throat> represents all aspects of the energy industry. Uh, our people have uh, worked in 104 countries throughout the world. Uh, thank you to uh, the support uh, and, uh, and continuous involvement of USAID, <clears throat> DOE, uh, and, uh, and the State Department. Uh, we've worked uh, in uh, countries uh, that are unbelievably complex and some countries in which there's absolutely no energy whatsoever. And in some countries where you have a population of 100 million people and 30 million of them ha might have some form of energy and 70 million of them are without energy entirely. So when we turn to the incredible riches and resources, not just in the sense of natural resources, which are uh, remarkable in the Four Corners area, but the resources in the kind of people, the, the complexity and fascinating history, background and dedication of the people uh, involved with the tribes, and from the tribes. It makes it incredibly exciting uh, and, uh, and a point of honor for us to have gone hand in hand with you throughout this uh, series. And I know Michael and Michelle have been incredibly involved in it too from day one and have helped to uh, formulate ideas working with you all uh, and to help turn them into action and to uh, education uh, for those who have an interest in the area, both uh, professionally uh, personally uh, and uh, financially. So we are so happy to be part of this and this series of six posted on the website, free to all to try to understand what the issues associated with the Four Corners are and what the opportunities are, as well as the problems, the concerns and the complexities. So <clears throat> we uh, urge you to please look at our website, uh, take a look at some of the other uh, possibilities for ideas and sharing and uh, some of the cutting edge things that we're uh, supporting DOE uh, and uh, state uh, on throughout the world. 
but uh, right at home. Uh, this is a joy to be a part of, and we're so delighted. I've had an opportunity to be listening in and, and saying a few words at some of the other uh, some of the other sessions that you've held. And I must say, it was a tremendous learning experience. And they, while the uh, present is fraught with complexities and concerns, uh, the future is extremely promising and hopeful and will hopefully bring incredible benefits to the Four Corners area as it makes this incredible transition from the way things were to the way things are going to be. So I, I'm delighted to be with you and, and pleased to turn the to turn the program back over back over to Michael, uh, Michelle, and the rest of the participants. God bless you and thank you for do donating your time and, and uh, intelligence and commitment to this fabulous, fabulous program. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you very much for taking the time and and uh, taking the taking the leadership uh, of, of the group for sure. Uh, I'm, it's great, Steve and Derek, to work with you guys. Uh, it's sad that this is the, the sixth and the last one of these series. I'll tell you that uh, every one of them, there's been great information and insights that aren't found anywhere else. Um, for what it's worth, for those that are watching right now, these six programs will be sitting on the USCA website, fully accessible. And, and I recommend those that have not looked at the previous sessions that, uh, that Derek and Steve have assembled here, you, you really should. Uh, it's, a, it's an insight and a window into the world of the tribal opportunities that and issues that we don't normally find uh, elsewhere. With that, I'm actually going to do something that I, I, I don't do easily, and that is to shut up and turn this over to Derek and let you run and thank you guys again. And like, sorry, this is the last one of the six. Maybe we'll find a whole bunch more in the future. And with that, Derek, yours. Thank you, Mike, and yate, everybody. As everybody said, I am Derek Watchman, and I and Steve Gray uh, have been engaged by the Department of Energy, the, the Office of Fossil Fuels, Fossil Energy, and of course, USCA to host a series of six energy webinars. And so I am president of my company, Sagebrush Hill Group, LLC, a Navajo professional service group here in Winter Rock, Arizona. And so, We've been tasked, and this is our, our sixth and final webinar series, we've been tasked to, to bring conversation to bear regarding tribal energy development um, and, and what's in store for Indian country. And so, you know, the, the backdrop, as we know, is that we're dealing with, you know, climate change, we're dealing with the need to reduce our carbon footprint, uh, we're dealing with, you know, changes in our environment. And so, uh, I am Navajo myself, and I come from the Four Corners area, as, as Sheila referenced. And so, you know, one of the big things that, that I am aware of that many of our tribes here in the United States have significant resources available, and much of that is actually fossil-based. And so, you know, as we're, as we're talking about reducing our carbon footprint, as we're talking about reducing carbon emissions, the, the challenge for many of the carbon-based tribes is how do you transition into a renewable or clean energy and environment? And as, as we've been discussing, that, that's not gonna be an easy task. And so, but today, the, the major topic that, that I'm aware of, and, and Steve and I will get into it in a minute here is, access to capital because of reservation settings, trust land, sovereignty. In some cases that creates and imposes some additional hurdles that, that maybe you don't see on, on non-reservation settings. Uh, but I'm gonna, before I continue, I will turn it over to my good friend and partner, Steve Gray uh, to introduce himself. So Steve. Yes, uh, thank you, Derek. Um, and again, we want to thank the Department of Energy and USEA for uh, their continual support to work with us um, as we outreach uh, to Indian country. As, as uh, Derek mentioned, today's uh, topic <clears throat> is interesting um, and important uh, because it talks about the finances. 
it talks about that access to capital. That, that's really important in, in our minds. The earlier um, webinars that you listened to, a lot of them uh, were, were projects that were ongoing, projects that were being proposed. Um, a lot of them had a lot of technical information about what those new technologies were all about. Those are all tribal opportunities. But at the cornerstone, what you also forget about is the financing, you know, on how do you get some of these projects done? And, you know, today's lineup um, is, are with individuals that, that deal in that space. And we feel that it's very important for the audience to see that because at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do as we go through this transition that, that we, everybody's calling a transition, you know, we're moving from clean energy, we're managing carbon, <clears throat> we're looking at renewables. As, as that starts to occur, you know, you, and you create projects, you have to look at the finances on that side of it. But you also have to realize that we're also trying to make an economic impact across tribal lands as well. And that's really, really important. So we want the tribes to be a player at the table. We want them to be able to come to the table, to, to come um, and be able to provide their input because uh, economic development plays a big role in their communities. They, they want good jobs, good paying jobs. They, they want revenue that will help the tribe. And so as we put all these things together as a package, then tribes can be able to start to assess what is in their best interests for their communities, for their tribes. And so again, we're very pleased, you know, today that uh, we, we can bring this portion of it. Um, and we hope that uh, people that listen in will understand the, the economic opportunities that are there across tribal lands. You saw that when, uh, before the transition, um, especially in the, in, in, in the energy area. Now you will see a different form and so we're looking forward to being able to share some of this uh, knowledge with everyone today. So again, we, we welcome you all and we thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Steve. And so today's lineup is uh, first, uh, John Lushetsky. He is with the U United States Department of Energy's Loan Program Office. And he's gonna talk about the, the loan guarantee program that uh, has been set up at DOE. Next, we'll have David Johnson and he's the acting division chief uh, within the Department of Interior's uh, Indian Credit Office. And he'll, he'll speak to us about the, what is known as the, the BI loan guarantee program. And uh, between the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior, two great credit support programs that is available and then we'll end with uh, a presentation, some comments from Mr. William Mike Ledick, who is uh, the um, national executive and the, the, the primary lead for Native American banking at Key Bank. And so uh, I thank you gentlemen for joining us. I really, really appreciate it uh, on behalf of uh, Sage versus Hill Group and, and myself and so, uh, you know, I, I'll start off the, with a couple of things. One is that it's, it's been a challenge and it, for, for many, many reasons to offer credit in any country. And so in, in, in many cases, from my experience, having to support the credit is probably essential. Um, and so that's the reason why you see the loan guarantee programs within the federal agencies, including energy and interior. And so um, so having said that, I'd like to turn the time over to the Department of Energy and John uh, to talk about the LPO program and what's going on on their, on their side. So thank you, John, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Great. 
Well, thanks very much, Derek. And uh, thanks to, to you and Steve and, and USEA for, for putting together this forum and, and really the whole series. Uh, I've been able to see a, a few of the things uh, that you all have put on. Certainly it's great to, to put a spotlight on, on this particular topic of Indian energy development and the many facets of that. And uh, I think it's a great series and, and will be a, a great resource for tribes and others to, to go back and view. So um, just to kick things off um, from a housekeeping standpoint, uh, Michelle, do you want me to um, share my screen or what's the best way here to kind of go through uh, slides. Um, uh, yes, please. If you could, you should be able to share your screen and put up your presentation. Great. Great. Um, that way we don't have to say next, next, next all the time. That's, that's perfectly fine. We, uh, we can do that and hopefully that will work. So, so again, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity and, um, uh, great to sort of be uh, kicking us off <clears throat> this afternoon. My name is John Leshetsky, as Derek said. I'm a senior advisor at, at the Department of Energy Loan Programs Office. And, and just to orient folks, because I know um, uh, not everybody is familiar with the Department of Energy, uh, the Loan Programs Office is, is a separate office. Uh, you heard mention of the Office of Fossil Energy. That's one of our sister offices within the department. Many of you may be familiar with the Office of Ener uh, Indian Energy, which is uh, headed by Wahela Johns, uh, and previously was headed by, by Kevin Frost. Uh, both of those are separate organizations. Uh, Office of Indian Energy specifically is, is one that certainly worked with tribes uh, very closely, and, and we also work with them. Uh, they have a grant program, which is certainly, I think, part of this discussion about Indian energy and, and helping tribes uh, achieve energy security and economic development through, through energy projects. Uh, but that grant program is, is distinctly different from the programs that the Loan Programs Office uh, administers. Just very simply, we, we administer really different loan programs uh, that are all meant to provide debt capital uh, to achieve particular objectives. Um, we have programs that are set up, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of uh, bringing in new technologies uh, into uh, commercialization. And, and we've had conversations with tribes that are interested in using these programs to, to advance projects with new technologies. Uh, our tribal energy loan guarantee program, though, is one that specifically is oriented to tribes uh, to help them uh, address sort of a capital gap uh, that uh, is present in, uh, in funding energy projects uh, on tribal land or off tribal land. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. But uh, as this slide shows, we have, we're an office that has really broad capability in providing debt capital. Uh, we can be very, very flexible in the way that we structure that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think uh, the one thing really to emphasize here is we realize that, that energy project development uh, is a long-term process in many cases and takes a strong uh, financing partner uh, that is able to work through both the, the front end of that development process uh, as well as continue in partnership through a life uh, of, of a project. And we've, we've been able to demonstrate that through many of our other uh, energy programs and energy loan programs. And we look forward to continuing to demonstrate that with our tribal program as well. This just gives you sort of a, a, a very, very brief overview of the number of other projects that we've done. Uh, Derek mentioned renewables, Steve mentioned renewables. We have a very, very strong portfolio in renewable development. A lot, a lot of that in Western states that certainly overlap a lot of area of interest uh, for tribes, a lot of large scale uh, solar that has gone into that. Our programs also go into manufacturing, uh, specifically in the auto sector, uh, as well as uh, some work uh, in the nuclear space as well. 
So this just uh, goes into a little bit more detail in terms of the projects that we uh, we administer and really what makes up sort of what our, our $40 billion right now in, in authorized lending capacity is. We have, as I referred to as the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. That's a, again, a loan guarantee program where we can provide 90% guarantee to tribes. Uh, this is a new program for us and, and we are continuing to get the word out there to tribes to make sure that they're aware of it. Uh, it really is a, a program that's been out there uh, a little bit less than three years at this point. And I know David Johnson's gonna talk a little bit more about the BIA program, which probably people are much more familiar with and has been out there. But in many ways, our program is, is very, very simil similar to, to the BIA program. We also administer what we call the Innovative Energy Loan Guarantee Program. Uh, also, we for refer to it as Title 17 because that's sort of the authorizing language that it was originally uh, provided under. Uh, but this is both a, a loan guarantee as well as a direct loan program. And so you can come to us directly uh, and uh, the loan actually gets made through another part of the government and so it, it gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the financing, both working with established lenders, or if there is no established lender, then we can, we can certainly uh, have the government play that role. Uh, there is a uh, component in that program for advanced fossil energy. Uh, this would be something like carbon capture, something that is sequestering or reducing greenhouse gas emissions advanced nuclear, as I touched on before. And then finally, I probably the piece that's of most interest here, uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So any kind of advanced uh, renewable technology would certainly go into, into this category. And then finally, as I mentioned, the, the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing program, it's a program that we're looking at uh, very extensively for, for vehicles and vehicle supply chain. We actually have had some conversations with tribes that are looking to develop mineral resources on their property uh, that could potentially field uh, uh, um, supply into uh, the battery supply chain. So things like lithium, uh, cobalt, manganese. So from that standpoint, uh, those are all potentially eligible projects into that advanced technology vehicle manufacturing program. Um, a little bit more detail about the, the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. As I said, it's, it's, it's a loan guarantee program. It's really meant to help bring in lenders into this space and, and provide credit support through the form of a loan guarantee for tribal energy projects. Really, the only requirement is that the project be at least 51% uh, owned uh, by the tribe. So from that standpoint, it gives us uh, a lot of flexibility. We recognize that, um, so that tribes can't uh, take 100% equity position uh, in a lot of projects. So this gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of the program. It can be on tribal land, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, we've seen tribes interested in looking at developing projects off of tribal land. Uh, the, the project can supply a tribal um, business, a tribal, uh, tribal residence, but it doesn't need to either. It can, it can supply some sort of a commercial offtake. So again, uh, a large amount of, of flexibility. Uh, to the right there, you see really from a technology standpoint, sort of that flexibility as well. We can, we can do fossil energy uh, virtually of any type which includes uh, excavation or resource extraction. Uh, we can do renewable energy, really in all forms, wind, solar, geothermal projects. We can do transmission, both residential or distribution, as well as uh, grid transmission lines. We can also do oil and gas transmission lines as well under this program. And we can do uh, transportation fuels uh, both biofuels and, and even hydrogen, which has been uh, a topic that we have discussed with, with many tribes. Uh, really the only requirement other than the tribal ownership piece is that these are meant to be loans. 
uh, the applicant should be a, a lender. And so tribes should work with the lender uh, in terms of the formal application. The lender then would come to us and make that application. Um, and so from that standpoint, there needs to be some sort of a viable financial plan here that provides reasonable prospect of repayment back to the government. And, and in contrast to the grant programs in the Office of Indian Energy, we do have a requirement that these are financially viable and that there is a, a pathway for the government to be repaid. But again, a lot of flexibility from a technology standpoint, from a project structure standpoint that we would be glad uh, to talk more with. Tribes don't need to wait uh, to have a lender. We are glad to, to talk with them in a little bit more, in more detail uh, as soon as they think that they may have a, a project that, that may proceed forward and may be a candidate for this program. Uh, this gives a little bit more detail, and I'm not going to go through this line by line, but uh, a couple of things to emphasize again, uh, the ability to guarantee up to 90% of the debt and also the ability to go long tenors. I mean, up to 30 years, um, and uh, I think that's a unique position for us to be able to, to provide lending in that tenor, um, and we can work with a number of different structures. I, just, I wanna pause here also and just say, uh, as I said before, this is a new program for us, um, and we have received a lot of feedback uh, through, through different forums. Certainly forums like this are very, very important for, for us to sort of engage with tribes as well as developers and potential lenders and we are continuing to look at ways at which we can administer this program differently. Uh, many of you were out in Las Vegas, I think last week at the Renewable Energy Summit. You may have caught uh, Jigger Shaw, uh, our new executive director's uh, comments during Tuesday's lunch, where he indicated that we are specifically looking at a number of different modifications to the program uh, deferment of fees, I think, has been one piece of feedback that we've heard a lot about. and We're looking at that. Uh, so to the maximum extent possible, we want to uh, defer or minimize fees such that uh, they are not required, at least in, at least in the, the initial application. And so we're, we're listening to what people are telling us and, and trying to make those changes. So I would say stay tuned. Uh, certainly for more formal announcements, or if you want to talk with us more directly, uh, we're glad to engage and share with you some of the other things that we're looking at. One of the other things is from a tax equity structure for solar projects uh, or other projects that use tax equity or other types of tax structures, we are looking at how those, how those can be used with our program as, as well. We recognize that those are a significant source of reducing cost of capital uh, for uh, tribal projects that are pursuing uh, solar. And we wanna make sure our program is usable and adaptable to those sorts of structures. So, so again, bottom line is we are, we are continuing to look at the way we administer this program and trying to make it as easy as we can for tribes. We recognize the tribes uh, lack in many cases access to capital. And we're trying to make sure that this program is as, as useful and adaptable to their needs, I think, as possible. Uh, very quickly, I touched on the Advanced Fossil Program and the uh, Renewable Energy Program. I'm just going to go through these very quickly and turn uh, the floor back, uh, back over to Derek uh, and uh, our other speakers. Uh, but on this program and in the Advanced Fossil Program, and I'll just you know, touch on this one in more detail, this program is not specific to tribes, but certainly is one that we want tribes to be aware of. Uh, from a policy standpoint, this tribe again is, or this, uh, this program is meant to uh, sort of incentivize and support new technologies. So while we did a lot of large solar projects back around 2010, 2012 uh, under this program, we no longer look at those as sort of being new technologies anymore, but there are some other technologies uh, in the renewables and energy efficiency space that we would look at, uh, potentially microgrids 
uh, some advanced microgrids with some advanced storage may go under this program. And so we would encourage tribes that have an interest in that space to talk with us. Uh, really the, the, the qualifying points are, are the new technology and the ability to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So certainly any type of advanced solar or other advanced renewable technology would meet that requirement. There is a list of sort of um, candidate technologies or representative technologies there on the right that would, would meet that, uh, would be that requirement and would be potential examples. Um, some additional um, information here. Again, it can be either a loan guarantee or a direct loan program. Again, structured to very long terms, which uh, we recognize is, uh, is needed for some of these uh, new, uh, new technology uh, programs in order to make the numbers work. And uh, some other information there, which uh, we'll leave as reference. I think the bottom line is, as I've said a couple of times now, uh, the best way to kind of learn more is to reach out to us. Uh, and here's a lot of uh, contact information, both my contact information, as well as uh, our main uh, outreach office. And that's the best place to kind of start the conversation with us in terms of whether a project might be, might be suitable. And we would love to talk more and, and sort of explore what the project looks like and, and how our different programs uh, might be used. So with that, Derek, I'll, I'll cede the, the remaining time back to you and look forward to the, the questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great overview. And it, it, it sounds to me like not only, uh, not only do you have the Indian Loan Guarantee Program, but you have other products, which tribes are eligible for. Is that what you're saying, John? Okay, that's, that's good to know. So tribes yes. But absolutely. Um, if they have interest in that, those technology spaces, uh, they should definitely come talk with us. Great, great. That's very good. Thank you, John. Um, let, let's move on to uh, David Johnson with the Department of Interior. Welcome, David. It's good to uh, see you, and I appreciate you spending some time with us to, to talk about the, the uh, I'll call it the BI Loan Guarantee Program, uh, an effective program. Uh, I know that as chairman of the board for the National Center, one of my one of my goals has been to get more money for that program, and so I think in many cases that's probably the biggest constraint. Um, but I was I was happy to hear that uh, you were able to do several, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, several energy projects from a guarantee standpoint, and so uh, that that's good news for for our effort. So uh, David, I will turn the time over to you and, and welcome. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Derek, uh, for putting this together. Appreciate also Department of Energy and USEA, and uh, liked uh, watching uh, John's presentation there. Let me see if I can share my screen and uh, get this right. All right. If we're if we're up, I'm going to. Try to leave three words hanging in the air as part of our presentation. Uh, Self-determination, which I'm counting only once as one word. Uh, change and innovation. Um, as Derek mentioned, our program has been around a long time. It has been around since 1974 when the federal government, um, I'm here, see if it will advance. I'm having an advance issue here. You should be able to just click your mouse and it'll move to the next one or the arrows. Uh, you should be able to uh, click on the slide and it'll move forward or you could use the arrows. The, uh, I have no arrows and it is not responding to my computer. So it's no fun at all. Oh, there we go. This is the, um, this is the citation for our uh, statutory authority and our regulations. The, uh, this was part of a suite of programs that was brought about in the Indian Financing Act of 1974 when the federal government was shifting gears from paternalism to self-determination, the first word I left hanging in the air. We're very serious about having tribes and members of federally recognized tribes who own businesses 
determine their own fates and their own economic progress. Let's see if I can get, not sure which of the buttons I mashed. Uh, there we go, we're getting somewhere here. Um, I think one of the uh, comments that I heard earlier was that um, our program is unique among federal programs, which otherwise overlap uh, somewhat in trying to uh, fill credit gaps. Um, the unique things about Indian country, besides having the sort of problems that uh, require expertise like energy, that uh, require consideration of small business concerns, uh, lack of managerial experience, uh, modest, uh, modest collateral, that sort of thing. And uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture also has uh, loan guarantee programs which focus mostly on geographically remote uh, areas where uh, lenders can't really inspect collateral very well, and uh, they may have a lack of uh, infrastructure. Our program deals with all of that, plus um, the concern that many lenders have that uh, they just don't know how to enforce loan documents if that becomes a necessity in Indian country. There are a lot of federal laws that overlay certain tribes um, and tribes generally with which they may be unfamiliar. There may be um, local laws that uh, come into play from the tribes themselves, and they may be in some instances subject to tribal jurisdiction, all of which scares lenders that don't want to pay uh, high paid lawyers uh, to go educate themselves and become a bar the member of the local tribe. So what our program allows that, that many other federal loan guarantees do not allow, if there's a problem and the lender is not getting paid back, the lender does not necessarily have to liquidate collateral before locating uh, or, or, or defining its deficiency and then claiming its uh, guaranteed sum uh, on that basis. It can come directly to us and say, we've got a problem here, basically buy the loan from us. And then we pay them on our guaranteed percentage of the loan or ensured we have a small program which addresses very small uh, debts. Um, and like uh, John's program, ours goes up to 90% of outstanding principal interest and in, in accrued fees. So. Hopeful that um, There we go. Our program is general in nature. It has helped Indian country with basically any lawful Indian enterprise, except for a very few that we have um, limited by policy. There are some things we don't do, but in the energy sphere, uh, we, have, um, we have done recently a few deals, but I wanted to show you real briefly that we uh, really do cover all sorts of economic needs in Indian country. One thing we did on the Navajo Nation is we allowed uh, their uh, utility authority to purchase uh, a controlling interest um, from their uh, non-Indian partner so that they could direct the, the operations of the business that uh, it gives broadband and cellular service to the Navajo Nation. And that allowed them to steer um, perhaps a little less profit driven and a little more uh, tribal service driven. That helped them a lot. The next, uh, if I remember correctly, while well, this thing figures out how to advance, um, Una, Alaska. And this is a small community about 60 nautical miles, I think, west of, of Juneau. And uh, what we did there is we helped them fund a, a deep water port, which attracted the cruise industry. They now have 10 times as many cruise ships coming to their area as previously was the case. Um, we've done health clinics, we've done cultural centers. Really fun trying to figure out when this thing is gonna switch slides. Um, apparently I don't have a greatest internet connection here today. That is to accompany the fact that uh, my air conditioning went out yesterday. At 11.30 PM, it was 91 degrees upstairs in my house. Here we go, we've done hotels, convenience stores, bowling alleys. Um, as we try to advance here.
There we go. Um, chemical manufacturing, cosmetics firms. We do very small deals. We've done very large deals. The main limitation on our doing energy deals is and historically has been the size of our program. As Derek mentioned, he's and NCAI have done quite a bit to try to get our program um, a lot more ceiling. Our biggest year ever, we had $180 million in loan guarantee coverage that we were allowed to use. Um, last year, it fell precipitously for, uh, for um, a strange collision of events. Um, but I wanted to go on and talk about the fact that energy deals in particular, um, are not always the huge expenses they used to be, which used to really limit our program's ability to reach into and help um, tribes that wanted to take on an Indian uh, project. If you're running a couple of hundred million dollars, we can't touch it. But um, uh, for better or ill, some of, the, uh, some of the problems that have emerged in the uh, national energy structure, um, uh, collapses in the uh, energy and the electrical grid, uh, hacking a pipeline, uh, computer software, that sort of thing. I think a lot of people are thinking innovatively now and they want to get um, more insulated from that sort of, uh, of danger. And so we're seeing a lot more um, um, innovative approach towards smaller community-based um, projects. And those can in some instances get within our reach until we, our program is sufficiently large to take them on a bigger project, we can certainly do some of the small ones. And innovation is a big part of Indian country's um, history. Um, we have seen some really great uh, ideas come across our desk and uh, we try to educate ourselves on them. And our standard is uh, like John says, reasonable prospect of repayment. That is changing a little bit when uh, you consider that uh, the political uh, entities all around the country are grasping at different rates how important climate change is to plan and address for. Um, one of the innovative things that happened is a little story that I like to tell. Uh, this has nothing to do with Indian country, but there was a fellow who wanted to open a gas station near Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, he, uh, he went to the local planning folks and said, I bought this plot of land. Uh, I need a permit to open gas. Uh, I'm sorry, he, he wanted to open a restaurant. And they said, well, actually we don't need any restaurants but we do need a gas station. And uh, it wasn't what he wanted to do but he took the permit anyway because he knew he wasn't gonna get anywhere. And he opened a filling station. And then, um, let's see here. Really is messing, cramping my style here. This is an actual place, by the way, and I've been here. Got gas there. Petroleum. And also had a very fine meal inside. This uh, was rated as a four-star uh, restaurant, in fact. So let's see if I can get uh, the next slide to come up. We have um, done some uh, fossil-based uh, energy deals, including uh, we did uh, some business-related things. There was a wildcatter up in the uh, Dakotas who, who needed some financing for his uh, his repair business, and then we also had um, we also had a very large deal. The largest deal we've ever done was actually in the Southwest, where a tribe uh, recently decided that it wanted to buy up a bunch of functioning oil wells. The interesting thing, and how turning the corner uh, towards other energy standards uh, made manifest, is they don't really so much want the petroleum coming out of the ground. They're turning the corner. They want to produce the helium that's available. Um, so the point of these uh, slides, which come at their own leisure, uh, it seems to be that uh, major things change. We have to be responsive to that. And when you're talking about a program with 
a guaranteed product that can, again, like John's program, can cover loans of up to 30 years, you really have to use the crystal ball at, at your disposal and figure out where you're headed. Uh, because it may very well be that petroleum products will phase out uh, more quickly than is predicted, or that the need for uh, renewables will come along much more forcefully in the future. So it may be that a 15 or 20 year or 25 year horizon for paying back a petroleum based energy project uh, may not prove to be realistic any longer. And we have to consider that again with the reasonable prospect of repayment standard that the statute has, has been given to us. So anyway, our project stands ready to talk to you. Uh, we are very responsive to folks. We have four zones um, and we have credit officers there that are longstanding and people in the field for us have an average of uh, 15 and a half years with our program. And uh, they uh, have been known to, uh, to uh, help borrowers and lenders chew on deals until they're ready for prime time over a matter of weeks, months, sometimes even years. This is how we're divided up. Um, we have a very small staff, uh, but those people actually pick up the phone and talk to you. And they will help uh, shepherd through any projects that you wish to address their way. Uh, we don't have any uh, fees in our program except for a 2% loan guarantee premium. Um, and there is no annual uh, fee or uh, application fee or anything like that. So uh, basically, if you take a, uh, an Indian-owned project and bring it to a lender, a lender says, we'd like to do that, but we can't without the federal government backing us, talk to us. Uh, we'll see if we, can, uh, if we can handle it on our own. If we cannot, we'll certainly send it uh, John's way if it's too big for us to, to address. That I think I might be coming to a the end slide. We'll see in a minute. Okay, David. Thank you. Well, okay, I'm going to st <laughs> stop here because I think we really are at the end. And I can't, uh, I can't abide this, uh, this internet connection any longer. So I will stop sharing, but thank you all very much. You know, your, your technical difficulties reminds me of, of how we have to deal with internet here on Navajo. And I think in many reservations, broadband is just so weak and coverage is sporadic. And I've been on many Zoom calls where We've had to go to just audio because the video, because of the bandwidth, it just gets, just gets so it doesn't work. And so, but but thank you, David. Great great presentation. And I, I didn't realize the the amount of projects that you're supporting. And so great great overview. And so uh, we'll um, just for those of you that are that are um, uh, listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. Uh, we'll we'll try to spend some time at the end with some with some Q and A. Uh, so, in the interest of time, let me turn it over now to um, Mike Ledick with Key Bank, and um, he'll he'll share with us, you know, some of the activities that are going on from Key Bank. And so, uh, at the end, I think we'll we'll be able to have enough information, you know, to 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 discuss some particulars. So, Mike, thank you for joining us on such a last minute notice, and so. So uh, I appreciate your time. And so I'll turn it over to you to kind of hear about what's happening on the key bank side relative to tribal energy development and any minerals in any country. So floor is yours, Mike. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Derek and Steve, great to see you folks uh, on screen. Look forward to connecting in person very, very, very soon. Uh, John, uh, always good to see you. Thank you for your efforts. And David, uh, certainly appreciate what you're doing as well. Uh, just an observation before I kind of get into some statistics on what the bank markets look at for renewable energy. Uh, as we go through this, um, I'd like for you to focus on the number of financial institutions that are in the renewable energy space, kind of number one. Uh, and then number two, the magnitude of deals that are getting done, both in terms by volume and by dollar. And 
the third observation is the significant uh, absence of Native America in those transactions. So there's a, um, the, the deal flow, the interest by the financial community, and certainly by the developers, and certainly as energy takes a different shape as we address a variety of different issues globally, says there is an opportunity that is untapped for Native America. And from way up in the bleachers, I, I think it takes stakeholders that have an interest in improving the uh, playing field and access to capital for Native America, given all of the resources that are available there. Uh, it, it takes an, a, a commitment to, to stop the activities that we're doing and unaccustomed to and pause and say, how can we, knowing what, what the opportunities are, how can we as stakeholders, the private sector, certainly the government programs that are there, uh, the, the tribes and the developers in renewable energy collaborate on execution. Um, there's a significant amount of ideas that are flowing significant amount of resources that are untapped uh, in John in your world and certainly David I think there's some significant opportunities there as well and the financial community is running at a pace based on the accustomed nature of underwriting and that accustomed nature of underwriting hasn't trickled into the awareness level that Native America has has to have in order to participate so with that uh, let, let me get into kind of the table stakes, if you will, on the next slide on where we need to be. Uh, here, here's the criteria that financial community, and this is across all sectors of bank-based financial institutions that are looking at deploying capital and doing so in the renewable energy sector. So these, uh, this is uh, by all means not an ex exhaustive list of what a project evaluation looks like, but these are the table stakes. These are the ones that are the most critical. So if, if you're a tribe or a developer working with the tribe, take a look at these components uh, and they're broken down into two major categories. One is the construction side. What are the criteria, minimum criteria that it takes on the construction side and what are the operations? So um, it's just, just kind of going through these and, and not going through all of them, but the, uh, high points. Um, what is a contractor's experience and do they have a financial wherewithal? This is on the con contractor side to stand behind the warranties and the liquidation damages in the event that they can't uh, pull something together. So as a project comes together and a tribe has uh, the, the uh, resource space and they've got a project and they've got a, a, a budget to demonstrate that this is a financially viable deal on a pro forma basis, as you get underneath the hood of that, what are the critical components that bring a project to life? And what is the financial capacity of those individuals, those, those entities that are critical to um, developing a project and bringing, bringing it to life? And on the contractor side, financial capacity and experience is extremely important. And then the other is, what does the site look like? And, and how easy is the construction component? Are there potential issues that can arise that create delays, uh, create cost overruns. So taking a look at that component of it. So when a tribe is building an opportunity and pitching this to the financial community, contractor viability, contractor financial capacity, ease of construction, and then validation of the budget. Th this, act, the activity level in renewable energies is, um, has almost become an exact science from a financial risk assessment perspective. So these things are going to be validated by individuals that are doing the underwriting and the engineers that financial institutions employ as part of their teams to assess this viability. And then the scheduling, so all of these things are um, part of the evaluation from a team perspective for whoever is going to deploy the debt. And the sponsor, does the individual entity, and, and typically that sponsor is the combination of a developer and an owner. And in this instance, we're thinking of a tribe or the entity that that tribe creates as the ownership piece along with the developer. And then obviously if there are equities that are being 
uh, brought in on the construction side. You know, what is the what is the tenor of that? What is the um, kind of the the components of restrictions that are associated with the tax equity, and how are those understood so that they can be evaluated when that tax component piece truly becomes um, equity in the project. And then once you get your project fully developed, then the next phase of, uh, of assessment from an underwriting and risk perspective is who is going to take this. So obviously on the construction side, you build an energy project. What is its proximity to transmission lines? How do you get on the grid? What are the costs associated with that? Um, and then obviously the technology associated with that particular component, whether it's, uh, it's wind or solar or um, you know, sometimes hydroelectricity mills. What are all of those components and the financial viabilities? Because they're in this phase, there's going to be uh, the underwriters are going to be doing sensitivity analysis around this to build an assessment of what ifs in the event that there are issues, what kind of cushion is embedded in that construction site? Same thing on the operation side. So you build a project, you've got all of the expertise behind it, you get the financial capacity to offset any issues that are beyond the budget. And then once it's built and you have proven that you have technology and you've brought it in on budget on time, who is the off take? Who, who's going to buy that power? And typically the market is expecting an investment grade utility to be the off take user. And now it's evolving to private sector companies that have investment grade characteristics, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, you know, kind of on and on in that, in that category. Typically, publicly rated utility, that's been the most experienced, and that's where there is incentive at the utility space in order to take on projects like this that have renewable energy. Um, and then the structure, is it a fixed price? Are there, um, are there opportunities to pass on additional costs? Because uh, these projects will go over a period of time. And is there a revenue source that has the flexibility to be able to absorb any changes in the financial dynamic the project is built. Technology is a big deal. Uh, as um, you know, John and others can probably attest, when solar started, it was going through an R&D phase. It was going through an R&D phase in the financial space and the sponsor space. And as, uh, as that technology advanced, sometimes it outpaced the useful life of the technology that was put into place initially. And so, as technology continues to evolve, not as much of an issue according to our, our, our energy teams now as it was in the initial phases, but shelf life of the technology and its efficiency is, is really important as well. And on the operating, operating and maintenance, what is the, what is the uh, resume and experience of the team that's gonna be running this operation on behalf of the owner, the tribe, and the developer if there is a strategic alliance? And does it have that capacity to uh, really drive the efficiency and cost structure to the most economically viable benefit in, in operating them. And sponsor, in, in this case, the trial. Do they have a procedures in place? Are they developing a team of experienced individuals to manage that project and uh, delivering expertise through that one step removed from potentially other entities that are uh, being managed by either the government or uh, other other projects. And, and same with the, the tax equity piece. Again, on the operation side, if there, what, what is the burn off and what are the handcuffs associated and characteristics of that? So now we'll get into uh, a little bit of what this space looks like from, from uh, a, uh, a utilization perspective in this next slide and, and give you an idea as to where the, the market is. So if you take a look at 2020 and you add up those 10 financial institutions that have developed and deployed capital, that's $15 billion of activity in 2020, $15 billion. Native America is virtually unrepresented in all of those projects. And, and that's, that's the gap. That's what Derek and Steve want to create an awareness level about. It's not that energy and renewable energy is new to the financial community. It's, it's, it's been in, in place for a number of years, 10, 15, 20 years, where there has been a significant focus by the financial community on the financial viability and risk appropriate nature 
of providing capital to energy projects. 2020, $15 billion just in the top 10. So renewable energy execution and, and you know, a little bit about where key plays in that role and over 1900 projects, uh, 5.6 billion in capital committed against the 35 billion that has been raised in that space and built a team of 12 senior bankers have 70 plus M&A and capital raise uh, opportunities. So the opportunity in the private sector is significant. Again, what's missing is Indian country's participation. Um, so, and then as we go on to the, on to the final slide of, of where there is uh, substance is to kind of give you an idea um, of where the, uh, the financial community is on the next slide, where we have uh, additional um, issues and, and opportunities where I, I would suggest that uh, you know, Native America has an opportunity to play. Um, these, uh, the next two slides are really just a, a, an, a sample of the number of transactions that are getting done. Um, the the um, select renewable energy financing transactions, uh, what we reflect in the deck is 15 to 20 deals. And what's, a, what's important about those is those are good reference points for developer relationships. If there's anything that can help jumpstart access to capital in Indian country or energy is aligning Native American efforts with experienced developers, if not necessarily for a strategic alliance, but really taking the credibility of that project in the eyes of the capital providers up to a level that alleviates the concern of who's building this thing, who's operating this thing, and who's buying power. And addressing those major components is a step forward in getting the attention of the financial community um, as it relates to that access to capital. So when you get those major components of it answered and at least addressed, then you can go to what is the financial viability and do I need, and this is in kind of in the eyes of a financial provider, do I need some support? Should I call John and tap into his $2 billion worth of capital that can be provided on a guaranteed basis? The only time that that is really going to be a question that can be addressed is when the fundamentals of construction, operation, and offtake have been addressed. You get, the, you get that part of it addressed, then building a capital viability where risk is deemed to be appropriate, shared by either a guarantee piece, uh, a developer and the owner, all of those pieces can come together. But the work, the heavy lifting is construction, ease of construction, access to transmission, viability of your budget, uh, operating maintenance, the resume of the of that organization and the experience of those individuals, and the offtake. Where is it going to be sold, and does that math cover the capital that's being deployed for for that project? So, a, a part of it is, uh, I would suggest that we could come together, bring some stakeholders together. There's an energy project that's being contemplated somewhere in and it's being uh, developed and, and individuals are going through a process of learning what it takes to, to understand what they want to get done. If you have an, a financial uh, professional that is, that is part of the, of the um, activities that are going on routinely in the space and capital is being raised as one advisor, if you will, uh, and you've got to develop an experienced developer, is there? these developers are really looking for a way to continue to advance projects. And if there's a, a viable project in the Indian country, I, I guarantee you there's significant interest by developers to get that done. And if you get that piece of it done, then addressing the capital access piece can come uh, at that appropriate time. So addressing the access to capital before those fundamentals are built, 
uh, I think is going to be a significant exercise in futility and people are going to get frustrated. Um, and, and the idea is to really kind of get underneath the hood of a project with individuals or experts that help bring this project to life or determine what components need to be included to bring that project. Uh, so, so let me stop there. And again, uh, Steve and Derek, thank you for your work. Uh, I think what you guys are doing as it relates to building awareness level, I think it's extremely, extremely important. So uh, it, it's sometimes you, know, you look yourself in the mirror and wonder why in the heck you're doing it and uh, don't give it up. Thank you for everything you're doing. But again, if you take a look at these energy projects, um, these are projects that I think you can you can access from a resource perspective. Okay, what, what is it that you did? What how did this come together? And there are uh, developers and utilities and uh, project managers that are really looking at developing uh, and sharing their resources so projects like this can come to life in the country. Thanks again. Derek, I'm we're waiting for you. I, I got to tell you, this has been a lot of good insights and information given today. Um, Derek, I, I don't want to jump in front of you if you want to grab questions and stuff, but I've got, heck, I've got a handful that are fairly pertinent and relevant while we've got the three folks here in person that can probably answer pieces of each question. Well, uh, well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mike Moore. Let's let's just <clears throat> get into some Q and A. Uh, we'll we'll start with you, and um, you know, because we still have a little time. Great, great overview. And and yes, you know, it's it's it is challenging and and um, daunting in some cases to do a tribal energy project. But thank you, Mr. Ledick, Mike William Ledick, for presenting. So, um, Mike Moore, go ahead. Let's let's get into some questions now. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to go, I got a high level one to start with, and um, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's there in form. So I'm in the commercial world, non-tribal, and I've got a resource space that's been proven by a third party verifier, like if I've got oil and gas in the ground, proven producible reserves, or any other commodity like that, uh, I can go to the bank and I can, or I can go to Wall Street and raise debt or equity. And I've got that asset, and there's a third party that verifies it. If I'm a if I'm a, a nation, if I'm a tribal nation, and I've got these same resources, um, I can't do that because of a number of different issues. You have a trustee issue, and you have the the wrapped around sovereignty or access around it. Uh, but the valuable component is still there. Could it be that in a case like that? It could be it could be the proven producible reserves of helium sitting on Navajo reservation. It could be oil, gas, or coal. It could be it could be rare earth elements. It could be a number of things where the ability to raise the funds to put a project in motion with a substantial piece of ownership in the tribal's hands is very tough to do financially. But what if what if the trustee I BIA has a third party that verifies, yes, those resources are there. Yes, we're the trustee and custodian of those resources. We can, we can vouch for them and go to Treasury and say, Treasury, can you front us a certain amount of money based upon these resources? We, we know we're there. We hold in trust and as custodians, so they're not going to go anywhere. And then go out to the commercial world and backstop or, ba or go to the commercial world and backstop it with that kind of a vehicle. I know there's, I know it's not that simple. And, and I know that you just can't walk up and get that done, but I don't think anybody's tried to do it. And it would sure unlock a lot of value, oper money opportunities for the tribes that have these situations staring right back at them. I'll, I, I won't even, I don't need to name names in, in terms of places this could be done. It's more about the concept. But Mike, you, Mike Letty, you're down there 
uh, Navajo, you know you've got a lot of resources that are very valuable in the ground that may or may not be um, in the best interest of the public's eye today to produce oil and gas and coal, but they're still being consumed and still being produced by others. And they still have an, they still have an immediate near-term value, but they can't, it's very hard for that to get monetized. And we can go down the list, but helium's going to be a prime example. There's a lot of helium out there. And that, that, all the pieces that we're talking about here, the loan guarantee programs, the ability to help businesses connect the dots, you've got the commercial interests that can do things. Um, can we do something like that? And I, I leave it open to the three of you. And we don't have to spend a lot of time on it because I know that we don't have a solution, but I wanted to just paint that picture that there are, there are people like me and others that have been working around this for a while, trying to figure out how to cats cradle the right pieces to have something happen. Uh, let, let me take a stab at that. And sure. uh, conceptually, I think it's a phenomenal idea uh, it, for this for this reason. If, if you're able to get a, uh, utilizing your terminology, front funding from a source, and that front funding is willing to take a subordinate position so it acts like equity, that creates incentive in the financial community and, and depending on the size of that equity piece or subordinated piece, um, that then has the ability to attract different levels of capital. Uh, and you start at the very, very top in terms of the highest cost. If you go into the high yield debt market, there are high yield debt investors that are looking at the energy space. And when you get to burn those things off is when there is a viability from an economic perspective that has a cushion in it that's greater than 50%. That's kind of the, the proven production advance rates today that if you're looking on the balance sheet of financial institutions, your borrowing base is 50% of, of your proven production at a spot price level or whatever you have hedged over a time period that exceeds what the credit commitment would be. So if you're able to build in what is what looks like equity and feels like equity, and then have the private sector feel comfortable that they're in a senior position around that, then over time, that front funding can burn off, right? Based on viability, profitability of that operation. If you're truly unlocking resources, there should be um, revenues that begin to displace that, in this case, the example was treasury uh, and treasury gets their money back. And then this entity has had the ability to go into the markets, access the capital and um, prove that they've got a viable going concern over multiple economic cycles. But it happens only if there is some sort of risk capital that comes in and looks and acts like equity for a while. And that's a great concept. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it could be a, a game changer if we could put this together. Uh, John or David, anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 go ahead, David. Uh, you want me to take it? Yeah, I just, because it's so similar to a deal we actually did last year. Um, and the issue there again was proven reserves and some confusion or, or doubt that the lender had about um, its ability to, uh, to realize uh, on that collateral in case things went badly. That was the biggest deal we ever did. It was a $55 million deal. And it was precisely for that. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, to try to uh, basically turn the corner here and get towards helium uh, reserves. Um, the only other thing I would add to that from a federal perspective is that would require obviously some very specific legislation to enable Treasury to do something like that. Now it's done similar things in, in bailing out the auto industry and, and some other areas where basically, as you say, uh, it looked and felt like equity um, and made everybody feel a lot better about it. But uh, we, until that legislation exists, um, I don't know how we would be involved. We also, our guarantee program, we can't guarantee um, loans that are made by a government entity. So we wouldn't have an involvement with that. 
I, yeah, really nothing to, to add uh, to what uh, Mike and David already said. I, I think, yeah, it, it does sound certainly like it could be a, a very uh, important catalyst, um, you know, and, and uh, something that separate from uh, our programs could, could be very helpful. But uh, yeah, I think the need for legislation and maybe that's where, you know, this is where that idea starts, but but would be a very interesting program to explore. I appreciate the answers on that. It's 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 not an, it's not an easy one to get done, but there there's certainly the, there's some framework out there of other ways, other sectors in the marketplace have done this. They just have to do it with the government entity play and the tribal play and work through that one. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that's going on around us is the the the, the, the issue of fossil fuels, and uh, and I I'll, I'll admit a bias because that's kind of where I best, uh, cut my teeth is around the oil and gas and coal industries over the years. So I know a little bit more about that than I do renewables. But if at the end of the day, when, as Secretary Granholm is talking about the clean energy standard, and so is the White House. If I understand that correctly, that would mean that whatever technology can deliver zero or very low negative carbon electricity or products to the market, may that entity be the person that gets to do it rather than having a strictly a technology benefit for a low carbon, uh, no carbon electricity or other products into the market space. Does Business as usual, I understand, is not going to be supported very much in the, in the, in the, the, the not just the administration, but at a lot of levels as it's all changed. But if, if technology could take oil, gas, or coal resources that are, that, are, that are owned by the tribes and they're converted to a zero or negative output where CO2 is completely retrieved and, and, and put into sequestration, is that something you can look at even from the government side? Or is it just kind of just too many other things that you should be looking at rather than something like that? And it's not meant to be a loaded question. It's a practical one because a, a handful of tribes have a lot of these resources that right now they're being told not only are they worth zero, but they're a liability if you want to touch them. Yeah. So Mike, I can, I can respond. I mean, um, so I referred to uh, our Title 17 and specifically the, the advanced fossil sort of component of that program that is oriented toward carbon capture and sequestration projects. And there are some tribes uh, out there that are, I think uh, are, are, are very advanced and forward thinking and, and looking at assets uh, with uh, in developing them potentially with, with carbon capture and, and either for sequestration or enhanced oil recovery. Uh, those are two advanced technology types of projects uh, that could certainly be considered under our Title 17 program. Again, it's not tribal specific, but, right. but it's available for tribes. And certainly um, those are advanced technologies. They haven't been proven yet. Um, like solar was 10 years ago, and, and, and I think Mike referred to this, you know, traditional lenders aren't willing to kind of wade into those sorts of deals. And so our, I think our program is, is really very well suited to provide technology support or to, um, take the technology risk that's inherent in those sorts of projects. But exactly to your point, can be an asset for tribes that have those assets and are trying to think, how do I, how do I develop them and how do I do it, you know, in the current environment that we're in? Yep. I appreciate that, John. I Dave, think, Dave. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Um, I neglected to mention earlier, we have a very close relationship with the Division of Capital Investment in our office of Indian Energy. It used to be the Indian Energy and Economic Development. It was recently realigned Indian uh, Economic Development, but there is a Bureau of Indian Affairs Division of Energy and Mineral Development that has a great deal of expertise. Uh, and they have been grappling with these issues for a while as people slowly recognize that um, fossil fuels uh, may have to undergo a complete reevaluation. 
Uh, a big problem that has existed in Indian countries, of course, is that a lot of the uh, renewables, uh, you may have great wind resource, you may have great sun resources, but they may be very, uh, they may be miles and miles away from a place that could do a power purchase agreement. And uh, the cost of transmission becomes prohibitive. So they've got the expertise, they've talked to people who have been grappling with these issues for a while, and they can bounce, they're a great resource to bounce ideas off of and perhaps get some insights. And I, other than that, I, I get out of my depth pretty quickly. Yeah, fair enough, and I appreciate the, the insights there. And, and I just, it's a, a, a part, we've had, uh, when in the past administration, we had Chad Roop from the U.S. Department of Agricultural's uh, Rural Utility Services, and, and they had a number of similar service uh, loan programs and funding programs that were for rural economic development. I would assume that those, most of those programs are, are still intact. I think he, he, he'd inherited those coming in, and I, and I would assume that you guys probably have some kind of dialogue with USDA on some of these areas as well. Um, Derek, well, I, yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I was in and out. Thank you, Mike, for this question. Let me, Steve, what about what, what are your thoughts? And maybe you have um, yeah. So as I was listening to this, you know, I think one of the one of the things that is when you were talking about the traditional lenders, and I think David touched on it. You know, tribal governments are a government. <clears throat> it's, it's much like a municipal or a county or the state. They are a government. And so that's, you know, that's a big, you, you have to make that distinction between the government and then if it has a tribal enterprise or a tribal entity or, or just a, a, a company out there that, that the tribe endorses. And I think that's really important that you kind of recognize that, um, you know, because the government itself trying to insert itself, even a tribal government is very different to when, a, when it goes before a lender. And it's, it's kind of like, okay, this is a government I'm dealing with. And so I think you have to make that distinction there right up front and you have to try to separate the two. But that's what I was gonna, as I listened to the dialogue, I was, I was thinking about it. Yeah, well, thank you, Steve. You know, the, uh, this has been an interesting area for me and, and great presentation, gentlemen. I really, really appreciate it. You know, one of the things that I, that I think is happening in Indian country is that we have a new mandate, you know, uh, carbon reduction, uh, climate change. And so it, is there opportunities for tribes to get into the renewable energy market while at the same time, many of them are still, as I said earlier, still dependent, if you will, on the fossil energy resources. And so uh, like, for example, Steve and I's tribe, Navajo and, and, and Mike too, you know, heavily dependent on coal and, and now I have to move to another form of, of revenue. And so, mind you, the, uh, the energy development in any country has been in part to, to create royalties. You know, Navajo and many tribes get that royalty, either it's, it's from, from a barrel of oil or a ton of coal. The royalty goes and funds the, 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 the tribal operations. And so, uh, so that, that channel is now changing. And so, but how do you get there? You know, a lot of talk about let's move to renewable energy, a lot of job creation. But for me, the biggest word that I see is for our very own tribal governments, how do you, how do you replace that fossil energy cash flow with a renewable energy cash flow so that they can fund their tribes? And so that's the biggest challenge in Indian country. And we've had several discussions and it looks like Indian country for the most part is poised and is, is situated by maybe natural gas pipelines or by high voltage transmission lines. And so th there could be opportunities. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, open up the conversation. And so capital has been the biggest problem. And as Mike pointed out, there's all kinds of considerations that have to go into it. We have the credit support programs, if you will, from 
agriculture, energy, and interior. And so, so where do we go? You know, that, that's probably the big thing. I know that, uh, I know John, in, in, in your program, you're looking for um, some possible projects to, to look at. Um, so for us, how do we get that pipeline going? And as Mike pointed out, um, Mike, Mike let it, before you even get to, you know, talking to bankers, you have to have an understanding of, you know, does your project pencil out? Do you have the right team? So there's a lot of consideration that has to go into it. But Steve and I were hopeful that, that there's tribes out there that are talking to developers, they're situated, you know, in, in prime real estate area uh, locations. And so, you know, we, we hope that we can, you know, get, get some projects going and get it to the table. And, and what that does, again, is create royalties and create jobs. That's the focus. And so, uh, I, I, so at this point, I, I think it's been very, very eye-opening for me in terms of what's available. You know, the, the, the tribe should continue to look at working with uh, its federal partners. You know, sometimes we call them trustees, but I think in this case, you know, our federal partners and reach out to our contacts, you know, like for example, Mike Ledick at Key Bank and, and other banks that are out there. Um, it, 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 for energy projects that we're talking about, it's gonna take, you know, many of us and more, you know, to bring these projects to fruition. And so um, I, I, th I think at this point, if there are no other questions and I don't see any uh, Q&A, Mike, do you have anything? One more? Um, yeah, you know, just because this is the last one of your six series. Yes. I was wondering if we could get Joe Giovi to um, give us a couple of words. I know he's on. I don't know, Michelle, is Joe set up so he can participate? This has been, it, there's been a lot Not of- yet. Uh, yeah. I, I, okay, there's a lot of fantastic material that you and Steve have brought broad tape to the table. This webinar and the previous ones, but this one especially delivers even more umph to the work that you guys have been doing. And Joe uh, at DOE has been the primary uh, supporter for this program to get, to get done and get out the door uh, with USCA helping be a facilitator. And Joe, if you're available, I'd, it'd be great, I think, to uh, from the USCA side, to put a couple of words in here with uh, uh, with uh, Derek and Steve and, and uh, his presenters today. So it's nice to put Joe on the spot, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, we we're good enough friends that uh, that we can we can get. Uh, I'll get pay. I'll get a payback somewhere down. Can the road. you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. You're up. Okay, for some reason, my, my video is, every time I click it, it says you're not configured properly. I, I for some reason, uh, the, the Internet Explorer browser and, and whatever browser you're on isn't working. But anyway, it sounds like you can hear me. Okay. Um, just wanted to say uh, briefly, Derek, just to your comment, you, you mentioned uh, the energy transition from a fossil-based uh, system to a more renewable-based system. And of course, we're also interested in that may be the long-term vision, but there's another option, which is from a fossil-based system to a zero emission system using fossil, where we continue to use our coal and fossil resources, but we do it in a zero emission way. And that may be a transition um, to a future that's more long-term where we use uh, a more renewable. So, so that was just one comment I wanted to bring uh, that, that, that we always talk about energy transition. We sort of have long-term energy transition plans. We also have more midterm and moderate energy transition plans as well. Uh, I thought this was a very stimulating discussion. I think it was great. Um, Mike, your comments were fantastic, helping us see boots on the ground, what's actually happening. Uh, John and Dave, I think you guys both did a great job of highlighting that there are resources available out there. And um, and what the rules are, and 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 folks can look into those uh, in in greater future uh, in the future. Uh, Mike, uh, and in the background, Alex, Michelle, and Will at USCA, you guys are great partners, and uh, and it's a real blessing to be able to work with Steve and Derek. Uh, they've become uh, not just contacts but friends, uh, folks that I can uh, call on and 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 figure out what's actually going on uh, in in Indian lands. Uh, and we should also say that this six-part series is the second series. We also had an initial series that had two meetings in it uh, where 
Um, and so this is the second series. And so I don't see any reason why there couldn't be future series. Uh, the, the, the point of, um, yeah, Mike Moore puts his thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the idea is when you're trying to solve a problem, the first step is to listen. And so us at the Department of Energy are very keen on this. There are people doing things, there are solutions that are being proposed, but we have to listen and to really understand uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. We need to understand what's actually going on. And this series has been fantastic uh, to determine and, and to educate folks as to what is going on. And I hope that it's not just something that sits on USEA's website, but that it gets a lot of burn and a lot of promotion from people who want to come in and uh, uh, what do they call it nowadays with videos, binge, bin, you binge watch Netflix. Well, people ought to binge watch these webinars and if they do, I think they'll get a really good understanding and concept of, of, of what is going on right now as we recover from COVID. And of course, that's a great, that's a great precursor for what's going to happen in the future. So I guess there's a great quote that says that good people find a way to, to you know, interact. Uh, I don't think this is the final goodbye, even though this is the sixth of this final series. Uh, Derek and Steve and everybody else, we're going we're gonna to find ways to, to continue to work together and and uh, we all want the same things. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of fertile ground to continue to do good work in the future. So thank you all for everybody's work. And from the DOE's perspective, we're, we're very grateful. We think this is a very successful series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we, we appreciate that. Uh, Steve and I, on behalf of the Stage Hill Group, LLC, uh, and, and you're right, listen, conversation is the best course of action. A uh, lot of potential opportunity in Indian country, as, as I have always thought in my long career as a banker and economic developer. And so, we, but we appreciate, again, Department of Energy, you, Joe, and USCA for allowing us to host these webinars. We hope that there's more to come. And so thank you to, to David and John and Mike Gledick for talking about this important area. And so we're at 90 minutes. And so we, I will call this a very successful webinar. Um, and as Michelle has pointed out, this will be available on the USEA website. And uh, we hope that, that folks that are listening in, if you do have possible projects that you reach out, you reach out to your banker, Department of Energy, Department of Interior, or even to, to us to see how we could perhaps add some thought and move these projects to fruition. And as Steve Gray has been um, saying all along, you know, the, 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 the biggest opportunity and the biggest goal we want to see is job creation and economic development, which at the end enhances and boosts uh, and, and creates robust economies on reservations. And that is, you know, that would be great to see, you know, standard of living is great, access to services, access to electricity. And so we still have reservations that uh, still have a long way to go. And so energy is, is the key element to that. So with that, um, if there's nothing else, I want to say thank you. And this is the end of this webinar. And everybody be safe. And for now, wear your mask, you know, because I think that's, that's because of the variant coming up, you know, keep yourself safe and your family. So farewell, everybody. And hagona. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Bye now. Bye.